the work of love in the age of its technical reproductibility. Good morning to everybody and thank you for allowing me to be virtually with you from the other side of the Atlantic. Ours is an international conference on love in psychoanalysis and I feel deeply honored by being asked to make a contribution to be followed by an exchange on my proposals and statements. I am looking forward to this discussion as it is the main reason that moved me to accept the invitation. We cannot spend much time with the already well-known quotations of Freud and Lacan on love, and we will pass over them. Of course, you must have recognized it in my own title the paraphrases of the famous essay by Walter Benjamin and also take into account the presuppositions of this heading. First, the equivalence of work of art and work of love. Second, the idea of love as work, like in Kunstwerk or Traumwerk or Troyerwerk, three shocking Freudian words that would be neologisms in any language different from German where they do not sound like linguistic inventions. Third, and the most arguably of all from my psychoanalytic viewpoint, is that love changes through the ages, that there is a historicity of love that threatens us with falling into a sociological or culturalist reading and with losing the specificity of our own discourse. It would be not a real fall, inasmuch as Lacan could say that love is a cultural fact. Love would be out of the question were it not for culture. But what is the real subject of psychoanalysis? The subject itself, himself, herself, the sexuated subject. Is the subject a historic category? No, not from a structural psychoanalytic approach. Is the speaking subject, le parletro, the same through the ages? Yes and no. The subject is a body and has a body. The body speaks and because of this fact it requires the complement of speech. The other, the small other, has an other subject and the big other of language. For mankind, language is an organ, a component of the body, the specific organ, neurologically supported, that gives voice and, in doing so, humanizes the rest of the anatomic organs with the complete set that composes the body as organism. Is this the body of Rembrandt's lesson of anatomy? No, the naked corpse on the surgical bed is not the subject. The subject speaks. It is the agent and the receiver of a discourse and is attached to an enormous amount of extensions of its body. All kinds of different prostheses, clothes, furniture, writings that can be read, houses, domestic animals, foods, even symbolic parts of its human being. Laws, beliefs, knowledge, Unknown rules of kinship and rules of exchange, technical and technological devices, drugs, commodities. None of these dispositives are external things glued to the body. They constitute the body itself, real, symbolic and imaginary, a body that cannot be conceived from a merely biological viewpoint. The subject is the body with its extensions, not without them, a speaking being connected to the other, the other of the social link, this is the very definition of discourse. This is the subject of demand, of desire, of the artwork and of the love work, a cultural fact. The subject of the unconscious who has organs, tools, words, 
the subject provided with these linguistic and pragmatic extensions of its bodily organs in a Lacanian, of a you prefer Lacanian theory of the social link. The subject, the parallel, is an extern, eternal category that has to be related to the contingent and transitory technological addenda informing its body. Those epomnemata and pharmacon that the Rudan scored in so many of his writings. But let us go back to Benjamin's title and reflect over his conclusions. The work of art changes in nature because of the possibility of its technical, mechanical reproductibility. This change implies a, clear, implies a cleavage between the original with its aura and the reproductions that have lost this aura and which appears as a lack with regard to the original, a Lacanian loss of the object small a. Is there in love some equivalent of the aura that can be lost through the possibility of its reproductibility, even of its clonation? Is there an original and reproductions of it? Would the original be the mother's love? In the two senses of the genitive, subjective and objective of mother's love. Or an ideal form of love, courtois, romantic, passionate, sexual, that would be lost through repetition, lost in translation. The work of art, the work of love, may be informing, enforcing a mere analogy, unless love has to be taken as the model of paradigm of all art, or vice versa. Coming back to love historicity, ages, age of the handmade object satisfying needs, the manuscript book, age of the industrial commodity, the printed book, age of the informatic product that can abolish restrictions of time and space, the e-book, ages, ages of socio-political organization, sovereignty, hierarchical societies, as theorized by Legendre, where power proceeds from God and its representatives, Disciplinary societies, as considered by Foucault, that follow the model of capitalist appropriation of surplus value, and controlled social societies, promoted by Deleuze, where power is embodied in anonymous corporations governing a unified world through scientific inventions that take control of the subject from a web located outside the planet and that turn every man or woman into terminals or termites of its all-encompassing presence and power. We can formulate a hypothesis linking one to one the three forms of technological production of commodities, manual, industrial, informatic and the three forms of political organization of societies, hierarchical, disciplinary, and controlling. In the three ages, the subject is divided, the split subject, between its knowledge and its unconscious. This subject transfers the knowledge that it lacks to a transcendental subject, the subject supposed to know, supposed to know the truth about itself. The subject to, supposed to know, the psychoanalyst, becomes an object of the subject's love. This mirror of love allows the subject to prevent the development of anxiety. And we already know, love or anxiety, those are the two ways of bridging the gap between desire and jouissance. The object of love or of for liptide, of falling in love, is incarnated in the subject supposed to know, in its semblance, as Lacan said, and I quote in Bruce Fink's translation, I love the person I assume to have the knowledge. The question now is if the new cybernetic or informatic era 
changes the structure of the subject. The risk of posing this question is that of yielding to the appeal of novelties and giving them a transcendental importance when they are nothing but tickling and ephemeral data. We must reject the bulk of phenomenological empiric facts that constitute the usual stuff of media anecdotes. We must also forbid, forget the harbingers of apocalypses or of redemption caused by the technical advances owed to the cyber science and nanotechnologies. In short, we must not take into account the statistics or the presumptive and presumptuous essays advocating a new psychic economy or the finding of new mental illnesses or diagnostic labels that fill large shelves in libraries piling up in our computers. Instead, instead I propose to focus our attention on precisely the political economy of attention and its effects on the libidinal economy of the new generations. Of course, we are ready to admit that rules nowadays, as ever, know of nothing but exceptions with regard to every supposed rule. It is definitely the case in the fields of love and desire. To get straight into the matter without forgetting the aforementioned caveat, is the division of life in two forms of human experience, in line, online, something that distorts the subjective perception of oneself at opening the possibility for the subject to be plugged or connected 24-7? Are we being introduced to a new configuration of human life that eliminates the subject's time, time and space for reverie, for fantasy, for beyond alpha function, for paying attention to our neighbors, to the people who surround us, to the small changes in nature, even for organ lust and sexual drives replacing the organic functions of the body and making cyborgs of all of us, of men and of women, women alike. Are we the witnesses or the, of the birth of a new kind of subject, shut in a temporal spatial chamber or isolated in a capsule with its relation to its fellows restricted to contacts through social networks? People with an almost absolute loss of commitments to the other, when performative becomes futile or ineffective and the subject remains unengaged with its socios, with its attention spans largely reduced to almost zero by video games that demand automatic, immediate and thoughtless answers. People using and abusing neurotoxic substances that lead to an induced ataraxia. What the sum of these novelties imply for the experience of love, the subject of our conference in this not Gershwinian summertime? Is there a new logic of love, the logic that Lacan underscored when he spoke about the capitalist discourse characterized by the primacy of calculation and evaluation the foreclosure of castration and a complete ejection out of the symbolic field of everything related to love. To continue this set of wry and rhetorical questions, is the accelerated transformation into cybers one of the many reasons for the reduction of psychoanalytic demand? What can incite one of these subjects to adapt itself to the requirements of the psychoanalytic cure where love is, as we know, the essential level. Of course, the answer lies in the symptom, the suffering that cannot be reduced with the usual neuropharmacological substances prescribed by Big Pharma to doctors and by doctors to its patients. Sustained examination of the subject by himself or through the other, the analyst, is increasingly elusive 
in our age of persistent technological stimulation. The continuity of time of attention is broken and we become used to new words describing this condition. Scatter brain, scatter life, shattered minds. The time has come to circumscribe our problem in psychoanalytic terms. In this brave new world, the whole second floor of the Lacanian graph of desire is severed from the first floor. The shortened and contemporary passage from the split subject to the ideal of the big other at the first floor skips desire, fantasy, the fading of the subject of drives, the question about the desire of the big other, que voy, the lack of a signifiers in the other, and the assumption of the lack on the line that carries from jouissance to castration. Instead, we now find a bypass through the mirror, linking the imaginary small other at the right to the ego at the left and through the symbolic, both of them reduced to the level of demand and satisfaction of demands. The way is open to suggestion and to drug-induced relief of symptoms avoiding the question of authentic knowledge of our impossibilities. Because of this short circuit, the subject is no more the subject of the unconscious desire, it becomes debased to the condition of a mere consumer of goods and goodies, drifting from one object to the next, careless of what he uses or wrecks. The field of the object choice in love is so wide that it shows a tendency to be unlimited. If everyone, or if everything, can be the, the object feeling the narcissistic lack in the subject, who would care about the other, the always and infinitely replaceable chosen object? What comes to the place of the Freudian Ichspaltung, split ego, or the, the Lacanian or Lacanian subject written as Sujet Barre. In other words, is it still the same subject of classical psychoanalysis who asks for a cure aiming at the lifting of neurotic Oedipal repressions? I think we can risk two alternative answers to the question regarding the supposedly transformed subject of the advanced technologies. A. Le sujet éclaté, scattered, machinical, deserving some kind of schizoanalysis, something that can be written not with a single, but with a double diagonal, crossing the letter S that figures the subject. Or B. Le sujet de la jouissance, the subject of enjoyment, noted only as a big S, with no bar over the letter S, appealing to a rare syntax used by Lacan in his seminar, to an expression that was banned by Lacan himself. Therefore, we could refer to this subject of jouissance as the final product of the suppression of the subject induced by the subject scientific depersonalization that follows the use of personal technologies, smart devices, social networks, etc. The command the subject receives is to comply with the instructions given by the artificial intelligence. In sum, the order is enjoy. It seems as if there was an incompatibility between Jewish and the desire in subjectivity. Is this really so? No. A possibility remains. Again, as Lacan said, I quote, only love allows jouissance to condescend to desire. End of quote. The alternative, as we already remarked, is anxiety. Now we can go back to our title propounding a new question. The work of art in the age of its technical reproductibility. What would love mean 
between cyborgs constituted by replaceable parts or are allowed to experience jouissance and to overcome the structural impossibility of the fulfillment of desire. If love is the result of the encounter of two interplaying lacks in the couple Erastes Eromenon, how can love arise between the bodies of the two parts of the mythical Aristophanes Androgynos, born after the divine surgery that split it in two? What kind of work is required when the essential question is that of Turing? Are you a human intelligent being or are you a device provided with speech and intelligence? If you cannot tell the difference, the very category of human has come to its robotic end. We are all of us in the process of becoming cyborgs with modified bodily organs and artificial smart organs that take command of the subject of the unconscious and regulate its coupling with another sexuated being. This is what you used to call love or hate and allowed us to relate to the other through a new kind of subject supposed to know. One who knows everything about each of us materialized in the web that connects every speaking being to a universal knowledge that pretends to have all the answers and skips the unconscious with its dreams and fantasies. In a remarkable film, Ex Machina, directed by Alex Garland in 2015, the inventor of the new Turing machine creates a model supposedly able to wipe out the difference between human and artificial intelligence. He grants his robot with a human shape and progresses from one version to the next, supposedly better one. 7.4 to 7.5 to 8.0. He uses some of the components of the inferior version, replacing the less efficient for new ones until he gets a perfect Turing machine built with plastic materials that succeeds in looking just like a human organism. Is it a human being with classical feelings and emotions? or is it an informatic compound? The inventor's work in progress strongly resembles our own process of constant superseding of organs and parts of our bodies for mechanical processes, smart devices or chemical substances that improve our performance. The cyber component takes dominance over the organic component of the cyborg. Also in this sense, the work of love is comparable to the work of art, Techné. Thus, love becomes the encounter between two speaking works of art, artful devices with the likenesses of dolls, puppets, pygmalions or Dr. Frankenstein's creations. The questions to be asked in a loving couple to each other in the age of mechanical reproductibility would be how much of you is a Turing machine? How advanced is your version of the Android? The answer could be maybe you prefer the best, maybe you like the worst of my components or organs. It is up to you to decide what you want me to be. I am ductile, ready to adjust to your demands and incorporate or change the new organs you may require. If you see that there is something I lack, oh, may I can get it in Amazon. Once the top floor of the graph of desire has been cut out, the bottom floor is regulated by the market, the true rival of the work of psychoanalysis. The satisfaction of demands replaces the unending search for the object of desire and its evasive encounter in love. Thus, psychoanalysis, the work of psychoanalysis, is also placed in the conjunction 
of the works of love and art. Thank you.